Hi friends, welcome to another episode of Beyond the Clouds, Edge to Edge Transformation. And talk about transformation. It's about scaling heights. It's also about going through the ups and downs. Nilesh and I got to know each other during the HP days. But also our fondness for mountaineering and music and dance. So Nilesh, please tell us a little bit about you. How did you become the Nilesh I know today? Thanks for inviting me, Shankar. Uh, excited to be here. I have had a very interesting journey. Um, I uh, I have had a lot of uh, fun things to do, like you said, mountaineering, dance. Uh, but I've also had a very interesting journey through HP. I live in the Bay Area, and uh, my friends always make fun of me because I'm the one guy who's worked at the same company for 24 years. The company has changed names three times. It was HP and then Agilent for multiple years, and now it's Keysight. I've pretty much been in uh, the same business unit ever since I graduated from college. It's been a fun ride, and, and I really, really enjoyed uh, some of the different roles that I've done there. So Nilesh, tell us what kept you at HP, Agilent, Keysight? Because as you know, there have been a multitude of startups. Looks like you've been doing startups within this company. Tell us a little bit about the adventures that you've gone through so far. I started at HP right out of college and uh, it was my first job. I probably didn't know what I was really getting into. Uh, but uh, when I was still in, in engineering college at Utah State University, almost everything that I did in the lab or in my design work was HP. There was an HP network analyzer that we were using. And uh, uh, I still remember the, the first time the professor let us in the lab, she said, this instrument probably is going to cost more than what most people make in two, three years. So be very, very careful. And we had an entire protocol before we touched it. I was like, wow, what company makes this? Oh, HP. So there, there was something special about HP. Uh, in the next uh, semester when we were doing design work, we were using HP uh, EDA software. And, and at that time, I didn't connect the dots that the next 25 years of my life would be associated with that software. And then uh, they came on campus to interview and I eventually landed a job with them in Southern California. It was great. I actually started in technical support. I was the guy you would call on the phones if you had any trouble and you didn't understand certain things about uh, the software. And uh, I really, really uh, have encountered some of the best people that I know. Uh, initially, I thought, what, what is, you know, piece of software? What does technical support mean, right? It's just a non-glamorous job in the back and, and all you're doing is just uh, answering questions. Well, it turns out, no, you're actually doing key engineering work. You get involved in design starts that uh, people have not even introduced in the market. You are... Uh, you are helping people design communication devices, phones, etc. And uh, one of the best part of the job was they would bring me on site face to face to do uh, in-depth training and design. And so I got to travel a lot. So the first three, four years was just, just fun. You know, me, a single young guy, getting to travel all around the country, visiting uh, multiple customer sites. That was great. You did never even know how time uh, passed. I was just enjoying myself. And then I got some interesting opportunities. So one of the best things I learned about HP was they care for you and they are involved in your development. Uh, one of the senior managers stopped by one day and said, you know, there's a job opening. You should apply for a job. I was like, I'm not looking for a job change. I'm enjoying what I'm doing. He said, no, I think you have the skills to try this out. It was a management position. And I think I was one of the youngest managers in the business unit at the age of 28. Uh, every three years, something similar happened. I got an opportunity at one time to lead uh, a core R&D team full of PhDs. You know, I'm not a PhD. It was like amazing to, to work with some really, really smart people. At some point, I got a chance to go out to, to the sales team and uh, be an application engineer. Um, then lead that team. Um, I, I got a chance to do a corporate role, looking at software throughout Keysight, not just uh, EDA. I eventually landed back in my current role, uh, which is uh, a senior director leading a lot of our uh, RF microwave device modeling and power electronics portfolio. So it's been it's been a very interesting journey, and uh, you know, rarely did I stop and plan my route. It was organic. Things just changed. Things just happened. 
and uh, the company is just uh, really really great to work with indeed i still remember on the pentium the first testing of the pentium was done on uh, what was called hp uh, analyzers so because my job was to ensure that the chipset that went into the pentium was able to capture different temperatures different uh, process points and all that stuff and a lot of the high frequency measurements had to be done uh, to make it a completely robust product i'm talking about 1990 now and today it's far more complex in fact uh, you can't design a high end chip without these things which reminds me um RF has always been an afterthought at companies like Cadence and Synopsys because bulk of the usage was in digital logic. Whereas HP took on that role and now at Keysight, can you tell us what are the big challenges today in RF and what's going on? Sure. Um, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, HP, uh, Agilent, and Keysight always looked at RF as, uh, as something that they grew up with. A lot of the design challenges and issues that uh, are observed in the industry were first seen by HP or as you know, key site engineers before the rest of the industry came across. And the reason is simple. As you know, key site today is known in a big way in the industry for test and measurement equipment. We make uh, spectrum analyzers, signal sources, network analyzers, uh, oscilloscopes. And these all run at really, really high frequencies or really high bandwidth. You have oscilloscopes that are doing measurements at 100 gigabits per second. So the chips inside the oscilloscope have to run at even higher frequencies. The heads and the probes and the cables, they all have to be rated at such high frequencies. Hence, they had to solve the design problem much earlier. So a lot of the EDA products that you see from HP that specialize in high frequency or high speed were designed for internal consumption. Some people call it uh, eating your own dog food. Well, you know, our headquarters are in Santa Rosa. We are uh, in wine country. So we say drinking our own wine. So we actually build a lot of things for our own consumption first. And uh, several of the simulation technologies that we've introduced were done just for that. Uh, and uh, that becomes a publicly available product because it's not just HP engineers who need it, but a lot of other engineers in the industry need it. Uh, so HP Agilent Keysight, uh, we have been in RF in high frequency, in high speed for, for many years. And as you said, some of the other companies, they really don't uh, pay attention to that. Now what's happening in the industry right now, uh, there are maybe two or three trends that, that are key. Uh, one is uh, for us, the move from 5G to 6G or 5G becoming even more prevalent than it is today. Um, and then eventually going into 6G research. Uh, and, and I can summarize that that move essentially as much higher frequencies and much higher bandwidth and all kinds of problems that show up because of that. Uh, whatever uh, physics, semiconductor physics or whatever uh, assumptions that you make about physics at a certain frequency, let's say uh, two and a half gigahertz or six gigahertz, are you sure that it's going to behave in the same way at 60 gigahertz or at 100 gigahertz? And you really need to measure this whole thing in a different way. You need to analyze this thing in a different way. So that's what 6G is going to bring us. 6G, uh, the frequencies that are uh, in consideration are much higher, uh, uh, 28, 60, talking about terahertz beyond 100 gigahertz. So these are all the things that are going to increase the demand for running a lot of analysis, lots of simulations. The other thing is bandwidth. Uh, again, 3G, 4G bandwidths were 20 megahertz. We got to a few hundred megahertz. We're talking about gigahertz of bandwidth on one carrier. Uh, again, are we sure our technologies of today can handle that? Uh, what new technology? So, you know, you see massive MIMO showing up. None of us want a new phone which works slower than the previous phone. None of us want a new phone where the megapixels on your camera is lower than the previous one. It's always more, more. We want more. Well, all of this has to go somewhere. The, the megapixel picture or video that you took has to be stored somewhere at the fastest speed possible. Maybe on, on your device itself, and that is another interesting signal integrity problem, but maybe in the cloud, and that is another communication problem that has to be solved. And, and again, we want it to be done within milliseconds. We don't even want to wait a minute for, for that. 
So all of these things are basically what what drives the move to to newer frequencies, newer technologies. Maybe the other aspect of what is changing is packaging, uh, for, for lack of a better word. Shankar, you and I live in the Bay Area. Most of the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, is single uh, family houses. If you drive around uh, Sunnyvale, Cupertino, you see a lot of single family houses. Maybe they have one story, two stories. We are talking about replacing that with skyscrapers. We're talking about replacing that with uh, what you would see in downtown San Francisco. And that's the advent of 3D packaging. What could be done previously, uh, spread out, people are saying there is no space for it. Uh, The amount of computing that is needed in a fully autonomous vehicle is is so huge that it's uh, a lot of people call it running a data center on wheels. Well, we don't have that much space. If, If the entire back half of the car is a data center, where are people going to sit? So we have to compress all of that and uh, the packaging technologies uh, that are being proposed, the 3D IC, 3D blocks, uh, chiplets, all of those things, they are driving a very interesting change in the market. So I I see those two things which are loosely tied together as the changes uh, are ahead of us. In fact, uh, I was just at Intel Innovation and uh, the CEO, Patrick Gelsinger, called it the Siliconomy. Do you see that these challenges, especially like near memory, in memory architectures that are necessary for neural networks, AI, are they going to be a big hindrance? And what about all the EMIR issues that come with it? Uh, are, are those the things that keep you awake at night? Yes, those are clearly challenges, but also opportunities. This is where uh, I run a team of, uh, of highly motivated software people that design the next generation simulators, that design the next generation uh, packaging options. So uh, I need to give them some exciting work to do. And this is all the exciting work uh, because yes, this is not going to be easy. Uh, as we move memory that is further away from uh, from a CPU or GPU closer or even above or embedded inside or some other combination, well, what is that going to mean? There is the promise of uh, faster communication. There's the promise of maybe uh, lower latency. There's the promise of lower power, but the engineering problem gets very, very different. If you are in a building, if the lower floors turn on their heat, the upper floors automatically get warmer. Well, that's the problem on chips too. So thermal is a huge problem to figure out. Uh, Almost everybody has that concern that I can bring chips together. I can have in memory. I can do all of these things. Will temperature play along? And if it doesn't, what kind of problems will it cause? Can I reliably understand the impact that temperature will have on uh, life cycle, on stress, on failure rates, on some, some kind of impact to yield, uh, and it is not really known. And the other thing is the electromagnetic performance. Uh, that also has a lot of concern. Uh, that also has potential solutions with proper shielding, proper packaging, uh, other kinds of things may be able to mitigate some of that. But really, do we know? All of this essentially means uh, a lot of analysis up front, a lot of simulation, a lot of EDA uh, comes into play. So I I look at that as a lot of opportunity. Um, In many ways, we are working with uh, several customers, several foundries. Uh, Earlier this week, I attended the TSMC OIP and the TSMC 3DIC workshop. So lots and lots of exciting things going on in that place. And and we work very closely with that ecosystem to, to enable these things. And speaking of drinking your own wine, as you are helping design all these AI machine learning generative AI technologies. Do you also get to use some of these things as you do your own development in uh, design or in EDA test and measurement? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, We absolutely involve ourselves in internal projects. Keyside develops a lot of test and measurement equipment and Keyside develops a lot of the in-house technologies. The general theme at Keyside is we will build it ourselves. We will rarely outsource anything. So not many people know, but Keysight has its own semiconductor fab. We have an Indian phosphide fab in Santa Rosa. We used to have other 
uh, three, five fabs like gallium arsenide before, but we mostly centered on indium phosphide as a technology um, that takes us really, really high performance at really high frequencies. Uh, our fabs are uh, not high volume. We are producing chips for our own consumption, and uh, that is not uh, millions or billions of chips. We are, we are doing it for low volume, but probably some of the toughest performances that you can think of. So we know what it takes to run a fab. As a person who's involved in an EDA group, uh, many other software companies don't understand this. Many EDA companies don't aren't that close to the semiconductor ecosystem. I, I just drive up two hours to Santa Rosa, I'm in the fab. They are working on cutting edge technology at even higher frequencies, and they come to us with demands and, and requests. I, I, I wish they were paying us. Uh, they get all the software for free, but they help us develop a lot of the latest and greatest uh, features and improvements. The other interesting thing is they also contribute to the technology stack. So we have Keysight Labs and we have many, many smart researchers that are just looking out in the future, five years, 10 years in the future. And they plan the next generation instrumentation that would be needed, the next generation chips that would be needed, but also the next generation software and modeling that would be needed. And that contributes back to our products. So one of the things that we have in AIML is an interesting modeling product called ANN or artificial neural network modeling. This came from Keysight Labs. They've been actually working on this technology for probably a decade. And they found interesting ways to say, hey, semiconductor physics is a complex beast. There are models out there that IEEE uh, brings to the table. Some of them work great, some of them don't. They have all these interesting issues. Here's a neural network based model with very little training, very little data, you can actually just do measurements and create a model on the fly. So that was something that has been introduced in the last year. Um, so we, we do this uh, drinking our own wine both ways. They contribute to us and whatever new simulation products that we build, uh, they get early access to that so they can uh, keep uh, building the next generation uh, instrumentation. So I guess you don't have to go elsewhere to do wafer probing, burn in boards and look at all the high frequency challenges on the tester and test boards, is that right? That's true, a lot of it just happens in-house and if there are issues, we hear about it first in-house. So, so a lot of things uh, we have access to. As I mentioned, uh, we do most of the things in 3.5 technologies. A silicon fab has its own beast, its own ecosystem. We are probably not running at uh, three nanometer those kinds of things are different. Um, so there is a different flavor uh, when you look at the Intels and the TSMCs of the world, but we, we get a, a big portion of this in-house. Yeah. But to create those complicated neural networks, you probably need chiplets that are made outside too, right? Because uh, uh, packaging those chiplets from different fabs is a very complex problem. Yeah. Are you actually encountering that either in-house or outside when you work with customers? Yeah, so uh, chiplets is something that has popped up in the last one to two years as uh, a major uh, change in the industry. And uh, this is, again, uh, we, we talked about advanced packaging and, and chiplets is, is just that. So maybe I, I'll, I'll turn the clock back about 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, several of the RF front end companies, so if you take any smartphone, and you take a look at the most important RF chip on it, the chip that communicates with the cell phone tower, or sometimes the chip that communicates with the router at home, the wireless thing, those are RF front ends. And the RF front ends used to be discrete chips, and they started getting into one package, and that was a multi-chip module. Uh, they were planar, a 2D or 2.5D, they were not stacked on top of each other, they were next to each other, but they got closer and closer and closer and encapsulated in a nice package. And that multi-chip module market is something we understand very well. We, we've been part of that whole ecosystem for about 10 years. A few select RF companies in the world uh, th that uh, produce those chips, they, they drove it. And the Broadcoms and the Qualcomms of the world, uh, those are the ones that, that drove uh, a, a lot of the change in that market. We understand what happens when a lot of separate chips come together. 
And these are different technologies. These are not single technology. So there could be a silicon germanium chip in there. There could be a pure CMOS switch in there. The main power amplifier would be uh, an HBT process, some, some kind of a gallium arsenide process. There is some acoustic filters. You know, there are so many bands that you have to deal with. And now there are filters thrown everywhere in, in that multi-chip module. So all of those things have been done at volume. Uh, again, remember, we are shipping more than a billion smartphones a year. We are shipping more than a billion multi-chip modules today a year. What else do we ship that's a billion, right? I actually Googled just to see what in the world today do we ship that is, you know, at that quantity. The closest thing I came up to is ramen noodles, is instant noodles. There's nothing else that, that has this much volume. So, so I, I find that fascinating. So here we are, we understand this market and, and my, my business unit, the EDA business, we, we've helped uh, with this whole ecosystem very well. Uh, now we come to chiplets and it's essentially taking that even to more complexity at a higher level. What if instead of just coming closer, we were up or down or some other combination? I don't think we've solved all the problems in that space but the problems are right to be solved uh, internally we have several projects and we are working early with several customers um, a lot of the chiplet conversation ends up being what was intel or nvidia what, what are the big companies working on uh, chiplets also is going to show up in smaller scale it's going to show up in aerospace it's going to show up at a, at a government uh, subprime contractor their chips are not going to be huge. They are not going to have a 5 million transistor uh, kind of CPU or GPU. They have a very tiny controller and tiny memory, but they also want to have advanced packaging and advanced uh, convergence. And, and they are probably going to be at much higher frequencies than we can imagine. All of those things are an area where Keysight really uh, shines. Speaking of all these chiplets and going higher and higher in frequency. I'm, I'm noticing that we're going, getting into millimeter waves, microwaves, and nanowaves. There is no end to it, looks like. And I saw the interesting theme recently at a major conference in Europe, which said waves without walls. Uh, and this happened to be in Germany. Can you kind of shed light on that? What's happening here? Thanks for bringing that up, Shankar. So I just got back last week uh, from Berlin. And there was a conference in Berlin, so European Microwave 2023 uh, was hosted in Berlin. It was a very exciting conference. And as you mentioned, the theme of the conference was waves without walls. And uh, we know about the Berlin Wall and the wall coming down. And so can we talk about waves or communication without walls? Right? That was the theme. And it was fascinating. Uh, so I, I felt I knew a little bit about Berlin history. I knew nothing. When I showed up there, uh, I did a couple of uh, tours uh, with, with guides and I learned a lot more about Berlin. I learned a lot more about World War II, um, some of the big atrocities, uh, Holocaust, uh, a, a lot of the information it was very hard. Um, and one of the great things about Berlin is they preserve the history. They don't want us to forget what the world went through, what happened after World War II, and uh, a big part of the wall, some of it has become art, but some of it is just like a museum quality. And they talk about all the different changes that led to World War II and the conditions in World War II, and then also what happened afterwards. Uh, that was very touching. It was things that I had not even imagined. Even though I thought I knew something about the history, I did not. Um, but then I looked beyond that to some of the positives and, and I have friends who moved from the Bay Area to Berlin and, and I met up with them. I have an employee who works for me who also was on vacation. He's German. He was, he's from Berlin. So he, we met up for dinner one day and I learned so much else about Berlin, which was, which was exciting. And, and one of the things that I learned was Berlin is a very young country. The wall came down in about 1990. And so a lot of development has happened after that. Another way Berlin is very unique is prime real estate in the middle of the city was never developed because the wall existed. There was two pieces of the wall, the east and the west. And so nothing could be developed in there. The wall went away. Now suddenly there's prime real estate. There is 
uh, canals and rivers and gardens and they built massive hotels and museums and art and there was so much more to do and, and Berlin just felt like a very vibrant city. That was another theme of what happens when walls come down. Uh, one of the themes that I have in my work is having an open ecosystem and can I stretch into design without walls? If I was a designer today and I didn't have any restriction, cost, and, and any handcuffs on, on what I can use, I would probably pick and choose the best tools for the job. I would probably use some uh, AI engines uh, to, to do some higher level synthesis design. Then I would use certain tools to do circuit design, uh, all the multi-physics design, I, I'd probably do that. Well, the products that are built today or the products that were built in the last decades they're not open enough. They don't facilitate that. Uh, what we've seen from software companies like Google and Apple is, or Amazon, is if you add uh, a layer of APIs to everything, the whole game changes. You can scale, you can multiply. So that is what I'm doing as part of one of the big initiatives in my group. Uh, we are directing a lot of our work into open APIs and uh, creating an ecosystem where if you like one piece of our simulator, you can just call it through an API and you can do a big, much bigger workflow outside. And uh, you can use it, you can iterate on it, you can uh, stitch together an extensive workflow with multiple companies. And what we believe is, if you are a design group, you are one of the big semiconductor companies doing design, you know better than I do what needs to be done. Let me get out of the way. I'm going to give you access to what you need and I will get out of the way rather than dictate how things should happen. So we, we do this quite a lot uh, at uh, the TSMC OIP this, uh, this week. We got an award because we worked with Synopsys and Ansys to enable just uh, such a workflow. So I'm very excited about what happens when walls come down. That is indeed exciting. And speaking of walls coming down, this whole ecosystem is getting so complex. You cannot have an autonomous car without looking at the entire city and the dynamics, right? You cannot just have any part, any chip in isolation. So uh, we keep hearing about this digital twins and the fact that you can't just end verification at the chip level or testing at the chip level. What's going on and are you guys participating in it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, digital twin has now become maybe an overused word. So I'll try and explain my definition of, of what I see. If you narrow your perspective, a digital twin can just look like a software model. So the fundamental building block, uh, a lot of uh, multi-physics simulations or design come down to the, the smallest element. And the smallest element could be a transistor or a diode, an active device in semiconductors. And if you look at the physical real transistor, right, that is something on a chip, you could have gotten a discrete transistor, those, those things are uh, almost uh, uh, not, not found anymore, but you could find a discrete transistor that may be the size of, uh, of maybe my fingernail here. If you really go down to the latest and greatest seven nanometer, five nanometer uh, designs, you could probably fill a million transistors on my fingernail, right? That's how small these things are. Well, what's the digital twin of it? The digital twin of a transistor is just a simple semiconductor model. I talked earlier about ANN, that is one version of a digital twin, but most likely it's a CMC based, uh, you know, compact modeling committee, IEEE based model. Uh, these are all our friends in Berkeley. They started SPICE and modeling. A lot of the models are, are based out of uh, core research that came out of Berkeley and other universities. Uh, so that's a digital twin. We, we have these for 25 years, so it's nothing new. What's new is when you scale higher. Like you said, okay, that's a transistor. Then you go higher. Okay, now it's at a chip. Then you go higher. Now there's a package. Then you go higher. Now it's a chiplet, multiple chips packaged together. Then you go higher. It's the environment around the chip. It's in a chassis. It's in a data center. It's in a phone. Oh, okay. So there is other things around that. You keep going higher and higher, and there is a lot of value in bringing the digital version of all of those things to make a better product. There's also a lot of work, risk, and, and engineering that needs to be done. 
So like you said, uh, I, I find digital twinning to be very, very popular with transport type of areas, autonomous cars, an airplane, a rocket, uh, all of these things. There is a physical one. It is really, really expensive to send a rocket up there and find out it's not going to work. So you digital twin as much as you can to understand the performances and what could go right or what could go wrong. And, and that's the extent of it. So yeah, if it's an autonomous car, can I get, create an environment around it? Uh, can I figure out if somebody in low light conditions in rain steps on the road, what will happen? Can I simulate the entire city? Uh, maybe the Holy Grail to try and go after. Uh, at Keysight, we are doing digital twin in, in a very interesting way. Uh, again, one of the unique things about Keysight is we do measurement and we do design. We are trying to see if our design is a digital twin of what happens in measurement. So a lot of people do system level measurement. They take an entire a uh, car or radar system of a car and measure that using preset equipment or they do an entire phone and do a measurement on that or they go lower and lower or higher and higher depending on that and we are trying to see can we duplicate that in the design phase and if we can can we make things seamless between one versus the other if you are doing some level of design you can just reuse everything that you're doing in design when you go to the measurement in the test area so, so that should help you save time. And it's consistent. The whole process would be consistent. You, you shouldn't have any uh, concern about things passing. That is the area that we play in uh, with, with Digital Twin. Wow, exciting. So speaking of breaking walls, uh, you've not just broken walls at different levels of design and different uh, complexities. I see that you folks have even wall, broken walls uh, around the world. Your offices in Germany and in India and all that. Is that helping in some ways to bridge the global supply chain issues that we are facing? Are you able to actually help different geographies get more resilient in some ways? Yeah, absolutely. This is one of the HP uh, legacies, uh, which is very, very rich for us. Uh, HP entered... Uh, Japan, uh, I think in the 50s, China in the 60s. HP was very, very clear strategically that we will be a global presence, a global company. And we've seen that same thing happen with Agilent. We see the same thing happen with Keysight. Uh, currently, I have people in my team in China. I have people in my team in Belgium. I have people in my team in India. I have people in my team in greater parts of uh, US, multiple cities. I have people in France. These are people that directly reported to me. And if I count all the people that I work with, our sales offices, our marketing, we, are, we cover the whole globe. There, there are a couple of really good benefits out of this. As you mentioned, this keeps us resilient. A few years ago, there was a major uh, fire in Santa Rosa. It disrupted us in many ways. However, our work kept going because the other regions were able to step in. We had multiple things that we just offloaded to another location and we were able to keep moving. Um, so this helps us in many ways. There are, there are times when a certain site has some issue or some problem or something else takes over. Uh, this also helps us with getting innovative ideas. No one region or no one person is the source of all truth or all ideas. And uh, we welcome ideas, improvements, and innovation from all around the world. Having a global workforce really, really helps and adds value to that. The, the third thing is it's, it's a great opportunity for me to learn about new cultures. On, on this trip to Berlin, I actually went a few days earlier to also go and visit my team in Belgium. First time in Belgium. I really, really enjoyed meeting people there. Lots of great ways for me to understand the culture and enjoy some of the great food and, and Belgian beer there too. What do you see coming up in the near future? The semiconductor industry is going through huge amounts of investments, uh, regional investments. Uh, previously, a lot of semiconductors were based out of Taiwan. But that's not the case anymore. It may still be a TSMC fab, but the TSMC fab may now be in Arizona, may also be in Germany, may also be in Japan. Uh, same thing with Intel, same thing with everyone else. Well. 
this kind of investment in semiconductors and, and Shankar, you and I have talked about the same kind of investment in India, in, in Gujarat. This is, is a great, exciting place. And it allows us at Keysight to be forefront in all of these areas. All of these fabs will have needs around device modeling, around creating PDKs, around simulation. They will also have needs around wafer testing and measurements and probing. And, and we have solutions in all of these different areas. So we, we are very excited about what this brings. So that's just a natural. The, you just see the market driving us towards that and, and we are geared towards uh, supporting that. The other couple of things we touched is, is the move from 5G to 6G. So we are going to be introducing exciting products, more multi-physics, more impact of one versus the other at higher frequencies. A lot of things coexist and impact each other. So we expect to, to have uh, things uh, come into, into space uh, for that from an EDA perspective. And then finally, the third thing is, is the packaging. The packaging thing is also uh, going to uh, allow us to do many interesting things. We talked about chiplets. One of the things about chiplets is uh, what is the signal integrity performance? In the past, uh, we were limited when the CPU and memory were far away from each other. We were limited by how fast the memory communication could be, right? We had DDR3, DDR4, DDR5. Well, now if you have high bandwidth memory right on top of your controller, on, on, on top of your CPU, does that mean it's going to be like double or triple of whatever the best speed was before? And the answer is potentially yes, but can you prove it? Can you do all the signal integrity and the power integrity analysis? So we have a lot of exciting things coming in the next year around that. Uh, so UCI is a chiplet standard for signal integrity. That's also something that one of our teams is working on. This is all good. And I'm so excited about what you are doing, uh, Anilesh. With all the high frequency work that you're doing day and night, how do you scale things in your personal life? My passion is being outdoors. So one of the things I, I like to tell people if, when they meet me the first time is I like movement. What I like is going out hiking. I like to go backpack. I like to uh, scale mountains uh, when, when, when possible. I set myself a goal maybe once every year, every second year I go off on, on a two, three week trip. My screen behind me, the peak in the, in the middle, uh, right above my head right now, that's actually Mount Everest. And this is from last year uh, when I went with a group of friends to Nepal and uh, did a two week trip up to Everest Base Camp. Going up to Everest Base Camp was so much fun. Uh, anybody who's interested in, in hiking, uh, connect with me. I'll give you all the details and I highly recommend you go. Uh, I read uh, some years ago that, that on your deathbed, you're not going to remember that one meeting that you attended or didn't attend, but you're always going to remember that one hiking or mountaineering trip that you took. Go scale the mountain, right? So, so to me, I, I really take that seriously. I think the memories that, that uh, you make when you are with friends and when you are doing something, uh, something fun, but also something a little bit challenging, uh, that's my uh, work-life balance and, 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 and staying active. Yeah. And have you been to any other mountains? I have done several of these kinds of trips. Average base camp is uh, roughly 17,600 feet. Next to average base camp is a Kongloma Pass. Uh, that's even higher. That's almost 18,400 feet. The highest I've ever been is in Africa, in Tanzania. So I, I scaled uh, Kilimanjaro uh, about seven years ago. And uh, Kilimanjaro was uh, 19,500 uh, feet. And that was another amazing trip again great being in in africa it, it has a completely different feel the people you go with the, the porters the guides some amazing stories amazing things in the u.s i've been up uh, mount whitney uh, that's the highest uh, peak uh, about 14,500. but the most challenging hike more challenging in every space camp more challenging than kilimanjaro was mount rainier and i did mount rainier about 10 years ago and that was brutal. It's a very, very, very tough climb with, with ropes and fairly technical. Uh, I've done a lot of backpacking trip. I've hiked through 
Zion National Park in the Narrows. I've been up in Yosemite, been up Half Dome, and you know, been been to a lot of different things. Uh, but but these are some of the big ones <laughs> that took several days or several weeks to to get there. This is exciting, and uh, Nilesh, I hope you continue to scale peaks in your personal life and also appreciate the valleys every once in a while. Maybe a dance here, a dance there. And uh, to everybody out there, I'm always looking for diverse opinions, different views. No one person has the key to the future. And the only way we'll know what's beyond all these clouds, what's beyond all these mountains, and how do we really make sense out of our life is to come forward and express and share. So please come forward. And Nilesh, thank you again. We'll have to do a hike together, maybe here in, um, in Big Sur. And thanks again for telling us all about your journey. Absolutely. We, we are going to go hike in Big Sur soon.